welcome. We are very excited to have Drew Crawley here with us today. Um, it's so great that he can be here. He is the director of building performance and Bentley Hello. Uh, there at Bentley now and has been for four and a half years. Four and a half years. Um, his building performance experience goes back 35 years, so he's a real expert. And um, an active member of Ashley, Ibiza, um, a fellow of both. And he's involved with the AIA, USGBC, lots of different organizations. Uh, most of you probably know a lot about Drew already, but um, we're excited that he's here. He's going to talk to us a little bit about um, from BIM to SIM, uh, getting billing information modeling information into your simulations for use. So with that, I will let him take it away. Thank you, Drew. Thank you, Drew. So today, I'm going to give you uh, a presentation on trying to deal with some of the issues I have with the geometry and, and building simulations. And uh, how do I get the data? Interfaces that we have for energy costs that is BIM based, which does make it easier to get the uh, get the simulation models running. But I'm, I'm going to show you some of the, the ways we do that, and quite frankly, it's still a challenge. So if I'm talking about BIM and BIM, BIM building information model or modeling, uh, 3D objects kind of the real focus there. Geometry, spatial relationship. Usually, objects that have some more information about them, I won't say they always do. Uh, geographic information, so it's actually uh, geospatially located. Uh, interactive models, so you can walk through them if you go the right way. Um, and I'd say can be a rich source of data. Not always. Um, too many times, uh, the focus is still more of a 3D version of CAD that I'm still trying to produce drawings at the end. And so you may not put attributes in uh, about walls. It would just be a wall that will have uh, information about its geometry and uh, how it relates to spaces, but that may be it. Uh, as far as SIM, what I'm talking about here is building performance simulation. And this is the idea of trying to create a model, an abstraction of uh, the building to look at its energy and environmental performance. I kind of interchangeably talk about energy and, and simulation, but it is broader than just energy. It, uh, daylighting, acoustics, uh, airflow, inside, outside the building, all sorts of things that are, are involved in this. And really, it's trying to, to look at ways of making our buildings better to, from a design or even a retrofit standpoint. But it is just an abstraction of a building. So uh, digital representation of the physical and functional characteristics. And these are specific uh, uh, definitions from the uh, National BIM standard, actually. Uh, the model is that representation, the modeling is using the software to do that and put it together. So when I talk about a model, need to remind people, I think sometimes they get lost in the details that if I create an energy model, it's the building. Well, it's not the building. It is a simplification, a representation of that in terms that the simulation model can understand. It probably doesn't have all the details that you would in a, in a uh, 
in more detail model. And really from this definition may be used for further studies of its characteristics so that you can look at it. And combining that as a simulation, you're trying to have that model change the variables within it and move to see what happens. For example, I change out glass. I make the window smaller, I make it bigger, I change the glass type is one example. That's the sort of thing that the simulation model is, is really best at. So why use BIM? Well, one of the reasons for software in general is it does help focus and foster collaboration among design teams. If you're using a common model or have to, to work between software platforms, then you've got to figure that out early. You can't uh, do the traditional throw the plans over the partition that uh, had been for so long. It also makes it very easy to do parametric modeling. You can do what ifs, you can change one item. There's software out there, BIM software now, that you can uh, write equations to create the model, uh, which is, uh, and that's true from a number of the, the versions. It has a tendency to improve the building model quality because you have one repository for the model. You start to look at interferences, uh, cost design and construction and inefficiencies, and so if you have a beam, a pipe running through a beam, for example, you see that before you hit the field. You can correct for that sort of thing. You can look at all the systems overlaid on each other uh, if it's used for that, and sometimes it's not. But because it's already much of that geometry, it makes it easy to look at uh, uh, sustainability issues, particularly building performance and, and uh, some of these other issues that are important. If you're doing things like uh, LEED or some of the other rating systems. And it allows you primarily because you've got a model you can reuse. One of the real problems with simulation, for those of you know, is creating that geometry first time. That takes a lot of effort. And I'll talk about some of the issues with that. I, I can remember back uh, doing initial ones, and we were sitting there with scales on drawings trying to create the model. And it, uh, it, let's just say it wasn't that efficient. I want to give some context to why buildings are important in our economy. And uh, just to give you a look at this, building energy use as part of our total energy has been growing uh, since the beginning. It's uh, for much of time, industrial energy use was the dominant energy use in our economy. And it's, it has, um, that has changed quite a bit. You see the industrial energy use down to 31%. 15 years ago, it was at 40. Now, buildings are growing so fast that they're becoming a, a bigger part of that. Transportation has stayed about the same, growing a little bit. But we have good standards that enforce efficiency in our cars and our other vehicles that really are pushing that there. Not so much in the buildings or the industrial sector. Uh, industry shrinking. Um, we're seeing more efficient use of energy in the, in the fuel plants. The old 100-year-old plants are, are coming offline. We're getting smaller, more agile systems uh, that are more efficient. But of course, we're also offshoring a lot of that very heaviest of the industrial. If you look at the buildings uh, portion at 40% of the energy use, uh, it's roughly half residential, half commercial. Commercial was growing. Um, and uh, it looked like about 2010 that it was going to overtake residential and be half of the building energy use. Well, then the recession occurred, and, I, and there's an awful lot of vacant space. If you still you go anywhere around the country, there's a lot of retail sitting empty, a lot of office space. So the commercial energy use has actually shrunk over the last few years and is a small proportion. Residential just continues to grow. OK. There we go. But one of the things that's important when you're thinking about a building is to understand that it's not a simple problem, even in a house, where we think of it as it's heating and cooling, maybe the major equipment, dishwashers, refrigerators, uh, lighting, and probably all the electronics we have in there. It's more than that. Um, you see the cooking, the fans and pumps, more fans and pumps than we've had in the past. That's increasing just as equipment's getting more. Uh, televisions actually are dropping a little bit as we 
go to the flat panels that the uh, energy use is going. But look at the 13% in other use. There's just a whole bunch of little stuff plugged in now that's not electronics and other things that are, are requiring uses. I, I look at it and you know, I forget about it, but the security system of my house is plugged into the wall. The fiber optic uh, internet is plugged into the wall. So those are all drawing little bits of power uh, in there. And you find them all throughout the house that, that I don't think about. So it's not a simple problem of just looking at the facade, looking at the envelope, and then making the systems efficient. We need to look at the whole uh, pie, as it were, of, of where energy is going. Commercial is even worse. Uh, you know, I think we tend to think of commercial buildings as the offices we sit in. Well, those are pretty simple. They have a lighting problem. They have a cooling problem. Sometimes the heating, if it's really uh, severe, and often office equipment and computers are really large. But the Trader Joe's across the parking lot has energy use of half of the energy is used for refrigeration and freezing. So keeping that food from spoiling is really important. So if suddenly this refrigeration is dominating it, lighting, heating, cooling are just not the issues for them, looking at the equipment. If you go to the Chipotle, where we got lunch today, probably half the energy use is related to cooking and preparing the food. Lighting and space conditioning is all kind of in the noise. So one of the important things to remember is you need to get a feel for what the end uses are and make sure that you're matching those. I mean, the, the problem, you know, residential is 13 uh, percent. Other uses is 33 percent. There's just so much going on in our spaces here that uh, are, is not being taken account of. So here's an example from a project that was pushing toward being net zero energy. Uh, they finally made it about eight years after the building was completed. They wound up covering a parking lot with uh, PV to make it happen. Now uh, this building already had, and I've got a picture of it later, already had the complete roof surface uh, was covered in PV. It was a curved roof and they'd integrated it so it was really unusual. Um, I'll, I'll talk more about it in a little bit. But this is the measured end-use energy for this particular building. They went in as a research project done by National Renewable Energy Lab and looked at the end uses. Now, no breakout in HVAC here, but we have boilers and we have heat pumps and other equipment there, so that's probably not bad. Equipment is high probably because the energy use is lower. This was about half of half or more uh, energy savings uh, compared to the 90.1 code at that time. Lights look really good at 13 percent. But let's look at the details that, because that's really where the issues come in. Now everything was monitored. This was a research project. It's not what you would do normally. But let's look at some of the outliers. Hydronic system electric boiler. Somebody forgot to tell the boiler it wasn't supposed to come on until the heat pump couldn't meet the load anymore. So the electric boiler was coming on all the time. And because nobody paid any attention to that, it used a quarter of the energy of the building. Now this is Ohio, so it gets cold, but it's, you know, it's not uh, real severe. Uh, the problem is just the control logic just wasn't working. These heat pumps were supposed to be taking the load, and yet the boiler was, was doing most of it. It was a ground source heat pump, so it had a great, uh, great source. Wastewater treatment. Here's a building that treats its own wastewater. It's got a natural biological system in a separate room by itself. But it, it takes 10% of the energy use of the building to maintain that wastewater or the space at temperatures for the biological systems and the pumping and everything that goes with it. It's something we don't think about in our commercial buildings, but our municipal, uh, play, our municipal uh, systems have to deal with pumping water to and from our buildings, dealing with wastewater treatment, and it's about on that order of magnitude. It's about to equal to 10 percent of the energy use. So anytime you can reduce water use, uh, whether it's whatever systems you can deal with, you're going to reduce the load on the city for that particular new building. So that's an important thing. It also reduces cost, and particularly with uh, the the drought situation that we've been seeing here, water is going to be uh, 
much more of it, continue to be much more of an issue. The water that comes out of this biological system is cleaner than the city water that goes in, yet the city requires them to dump the water. That's, they just don't trust it. Energy recovery units. Um, these are using about seven or eight percent of the energy use of the building. And the reason they found was the contractor didn't understand that you need to be able to access the uh, energy recovery units. They had filters in there, but you couldn't get to them. There was basically this much room to put a filter in, and you had to break the filter and put it through the 90 degree turn or to get it out. So these things were uh, putting a lot of uh, extra load on the air system, raising the static uh, a lot higher, and that's why we're seeing uh, energy recovery issues here. Um, it's a two-story building. We've got 3%, 2-3% for the energy use. The stairs are much more accessible. The elevator is not very accessible on purpose. Uh, what they found when they went in there and looked at the details was a hydraulic elevator, had a little heater on the hydraulic fluid that was supposed to be on from December to February, the cold time of the year, so the fluid saved viscous. Uh, it stayed on 365. So once they turned that off, they could cut two-thirds of the elevator down. Uh, PV system consumption. This had a lot of trouble. This is, is old enough. I mean, it's a decade ago um, that the PV systems, uh, the AC, uh, DC to AC, and other portion of the, the the system were causing loads on here. We were losing some of the power we were generating on the order of about five percent. It uh, took until they swapped out the system about six, seven years ago. And to replace these uh, conversion uh, piece of equipment and put in the new PV or the additional PV before they could eliminate that. Parking, uh, well, light. Looks good, but look at the detail. Parking lot, sidewalk, emergency lights. Those first three take up almost 10% of the 13. Um, what they didn't know, it's a, this is a university building at Oberlin College outside Cleveland. And people weren't there at night for the most part. All the exterior lights came on at dusk and stayed on till dawn. All of them, not security lights, everything. And they figured they could probably cut this in half just by reducing it to what was needed for security. But never would have known it because nobody was there. Uh, trying to pull the data together is uh, kind of difficult, especially if you're dealing with an existing, this is a schematic of a hospital project. They've got a 50-year-old part and a 40 and a 20-year-old part and they're trying to integrate it with a new office building and maybe update the systems and try to do it in a way that they don't uh, have to put in new chiller plants, for example. So they really want to look at efficiency throughout the whole building and, and uh, try and see if they can do that. But that takes a lot of data to try to understand how that building's done. Something of this age, you probably don't have as-built drawings. You're lucky if you know what systems are going on in there. Uh, so trying to collect some of the stuff about the location, you know, sunlight climate, that's, that's easy enough. But material, space use, lighting, humidity, airflow, system types, how they're controlled, that's, that can take a lot of effort and time. Uh, it's, but it's the stuff you need to really be able to deal with it, and you've got to do it if you're going to do a, um, if you're trying to create a calibrated model to be able to look at improvements in there. Uh, but even doing that is difficult. Sometimes it's going to take talking to the people operating them. I remember working on one uh, museum project. It was a beautiful system. Uh, the museum was a little odd, but. The, the systems were really beautiful. The floors were immaculate. I've never seen a machine room, uh, a mechanical room that was so clean. They just freshly painted. Everything was wonderful. Um, the system was set up as a constant volume system with uh, steam reheat, um, which was the most expensive fuel source you could possibly use in the Washington, D.C. area. It cost twice as much as electricity at the time. This is the central steam system used for the federal building. Um, and they were using it for reheat and humidification, and it was a big chunk of the load. The system was set up with kind of a, a half-on and all-on for the constant volume, so not quite VAV, 
but it was an art museum, so they were trying to maintain humidity and temperature very closely. They were maintaining temperature within a half a degree, and humidity was within about 3 or 4 percent. You could see the lines were flat. But they were also using um, the most energy I've ever seen in a building, 160,000 square foot building, and it cost $1.2 million a year to operate, over $10 a square foot. This was 30 years ago. Uh, and part of the reasons we collecting data, and they said, oh, yeah, well, we have 18-inch cast concrete walls and plaster. There's no vapor barrier, no insulation whatsoever. So you go down into the mechanical room, and you look at the, the central coils, and water is pouring off because the museum is acting as a humidity sink, and water is pouring through those walls uh, uh, during that time of year. So, it, you know, it's that sort of detail. And what we couldn't quite get the model calibrated, even knowing all that, until we talked to the operator who said, oh, uh, we never use the lower mode. We always use it full on. So it's always full constant volume reheat system uh, for that particular building. Uh, we said we did uh, analysis that showed they could save about 75 percent of the energy, but they were basically going to have to take all the walls down to the concrete and put in vapor barriers and other things. And, the director sort of declined. He, he thought his collection of art was more important. So, so a little more on building simulation. It dynamic interaction, and there are systems that do dynamic, but Energy Plus and Do2 are not dynamic. I mean, they're they're doing a snapshot of an hour or sometimes. Uh, there are ones that will do it at real time, depending on the on the change. Uh, but they take a lot of computational time and can be really slow. You're not going to do full buildings with that. But so that interaction of heat, lights, mass, and sound within a building to predict its performance, and that's really what you're trying to use it for. Uh, it, you've got to know what's going on with climates. You've got a weather file of some sort. Occupants know where they are when they're moving around. Conditioning systems, controls, and other sources. But Simulation, I contend, is still more arduous. The tools, if you put the same number in to the tool twice in two different models, you're going to get the same results. You, you calculate, you'll get the same results. But the art is in knowing what it is that you need to put in. And I find too many people are out using simulation and don't have a good feel for what the energy should be. They take the first number that comes out of their model, whatever it is, and they think that's right. Well, it takes some experience to know being able to calibrate it to other models to be able to look at uh, um, it, actual energy use to understand what that's going on to get a feel for it. It's not something you can do overnight. I get uh, on a number of email lists and the ones that scare me, which seem to be slowing down, but I remember there was a period about five or six years ago where some just out of school master's student got hired by an engineer or an architect, and his boss said, oh, you did simulation in college. Uh, give me lead points for energy by the end of the week. And the guy hasn't really used the tool, and he's on the mail list going, can somebody please help me? I don't know where to start. And he's still way off in that um, sketch, not even art sort of science. Whoops. Come on. Sorry. Um, so that it does take some time to get a feel, looking at buildings, experience with buildings, knowing what's going on there. Some of the major challenges uh, we see, uh, knowing about the building and how it operates, maintaining that information throughout the life cycle is difficult. Keeping a BIM intact to make it as built Keeping it as a as used sort of situation is very difficult, even more so in simulation. Uh, knowing what the data is, how it's going to be used is, is difficult. And I'll, I've got an example here in just a minute of a project I worked on. We started off pre-designed very early doing simulations all the way into uh, bidding for that particular project. And the building shape changed a lot, and I'll talk more about that. Um, I find that we train people in using the tool rather than using 
the, uh, uh, the basic methods of simulation and understanding how you should do that. Uh, unfortunately, I see people take one tool that's meant to do certain things that it can't do, and you'll see people, how do I trick this tool into doing X? And the problem is that tool really doesn't have the capability. You don't know how good the results are going to be unless you've got some measured data. And I don't think we've got a lot of that. The tools have got to encourage um, new technologies. And I think we got behind uh, for many years in, in some of the simulation tools. Do2, kind of the, the biggest tool around there. When I was at Department of Energy, that was one of the first things I was working on. And uh, they, um, they'd come to me and say, well, we'd like to, I think I'm having driver problems, sorry. Um, they'd come to me and say, we want to add a new capability within uh, DOE 2, and I'd say, how long would it take? And they'd say, well, maybe a month, and we could add it. They want to do electrochromic windows, for example. But then it'd take us 18 months to unbreak everything we broke in the process. Uh, DOE 2 is a kind of a monolithic 180,000 lines of Fortran code, and at that point there were three or four people who could change it. So that's one of the reasons that we went to Energy Plus to make it easier to add new modules to be able to plop things in rather than trying to figure out where I'm going to break it. But we still have got a lot of technologies and systems we can't simulate. Um, I think that that's kind of been an issue. VRF, VRV has been one that's uh, just hitting getting enough information. But even those models are incomplete. We don't have good curves for equipment. Uh, if you're doing simulation, you know, getting the geometry together is a challenge. You may have a BIM model, great, but even sometimes translating that is going to be a significant challenge and a lot of work. Uh, the last 10 years has been kind of wild watching the drive and the growth in the simulation area. Um, I can remember when it was, you know, there were maybe a few hundred people in the U.S working on simulation, and that was kind of it. And now, because of the sustainability, particularly the need for lead points, or maybe IGCC with its performance path, or in Europe, the energy performance certificates, where you are required to produce a certificate if any change in ownership or leasing occurs on any building over a certain square footage. Uh, Title 24 in California has been pushing simulation since the 70s, and really it's gotten to the point where half of the building permits in California, or at least half the square footage, has been run through simulation. But they've done a lot to try to make that easy. Uh, ASHRAE 90.1, pushing the efficiency. The latest version, the 2013 version, is uh, on the, I haven't seen the final numbers, but it is a full, um, 35% lower energy use than the 90.1-2004. There was a huge change in 2010 and about another 10% in, uh, in 2013. That's what's getting into the IECC, the IGCC, and pushing that. ASHRAE, with its 189 standard, working together with Green Building Council, has been pushing something beyond that and uh, pushing that as a baseline for moving that. You may have seen recently that was uh, going to be the technical requirements for the IGCC and pushing that forward uh, as we move as we move that. So these sort of sustainability issues, policy pushing uh, in Europe and in here, with a lot of the federal agencies saying lead is a minimum, really trying to push beyond that. Uh, we do see quite a bit of interest in the net zero buildings, but I still think they're kind of I don't know. They're more onesie twosies. I can probably point to 50 or so worldwide at this point, uh, but they're they're still pretty big challenge. They're not driving the market yet. I think what they are doing is saying we can take 90.1 further, maybe not to zero. Although that's Ashray's goal by 2030 is net zero on 90.1. Uh, it's going to it's going to be a challenge for one. So. Lots of capabilities in new tools, uh, existing tools moving forward. 
interoperability has been a, in a big change. Uh, the group used to be known as IAI, or International Alliance for Interoperability, is now Building Smart, and they have a, um, a format for sharing data among building software. It's not just BIM, the simulation. Uh, it could be cost estimating, it could be civil, it could be all sorts of things going on. Their IFC has uh, been out there for a while, and it's one way of getting it. We've got GBXML, another format specifically for getting from BIM to SIM. Uh, has its own warts, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, there are also national BIM standards. I was at a workshop put on by the Department of Commerce uh, two weeks ago, and uh, they basically were saying that the U.S. is ahead of the rest of the world in putting together BIM standards. And we have a national BIM standard 2.0 that's out. They're working on 3.0 now. And it's taking all the bits and pieces that are out in the marketplace and publishing that. Uh, so that's pushing interoperability as well, not trying to say it's got to be the IFCs or other things. Um, visualization is that computers get more capable. Uh, being able to walk through a space is really important. I think it's important also just because building owners. How many building owners really understand a floor plan? I don't think very many. To be able to give them an image of the space, maybe if you're doing a daylighting, uh, study, for example, you would be able to give them an image of the space with different daylighting conditions and show them what it looks like. They'll understand that better than uh, some of the isocurves or, or other things that we might present. So translating data into the integration among the disciplines, um, tools that can do thermal analysis, energy, CFD, electrical, IAQ, visual, using the same model are really becoming uh, more useful. Uh, it kind of depends. I'm not seeing one that will do everything, and I'm not sure I'd want one that does everything. The insurance industry uh, is uh, really worried about risk assessment, and they're actually would like to see buildings that are more resilient. That seems to be the new term is resiliency. And uh, to show if you can Demonstrates that your building be able to operate even if you're out of power. Well, it would be difficult to use the computers, but you wouldn't. Uh, you could still function if there were a way to bring in other things. So that that's important. Uh, the insurance industry is very worried about changing uh, weather patterns and and risks there. Um, a lot of interest in embodied energy, life cycle inventory, life cycle analysis. Uh, LEED was supposed to be pushing that way to, to really use that as a basis for making decisions. I don't think it quite got there in this fourth version, but things that could build off a model that we already have that has much information, uh, and a lot of in, in interest. Commissions, big corporations that probably in their annual report want to producing, we save so many thousands of tons of CO2, reduce our carbon footprint by this. It's about the only time I see the emission. But this is becoming more capable, uh, more possible. Um, California's Title 24, the new version, will allow you to calculate hourly emission savings based on the power plant mix that you've got. They've got a pretty complicated model. It's, it's kind of cool what they're able to do. What it comes down to is we've got a lot more tools. There's uh, a software tools directory that started up almost 20 years ago now uh, at Department of Energy that has over 400 different tools in it. And it's you know, kind of a one-pager. Here's introduction. Here's where I find more information. Here's what it does, what it doesn't do, that sort of information. But you're finding things customized more to users' needs. What you'll see in, um, uh, for example, in DOE 2, there were almost 30 interfaces of various types for them. There was one that actually just did windows. You told it you had an office building, it was kind of this footprint, and it would assume a lot of things that allow you to go in real detail on the windows. And that's true also for Energy Plus now. So we're seeing kind of that customization to specific tool uh, areas. You, you know, want more, lower effort. Um, which I think is good, but I think um, the, the thing that bothers me about that, getting a, a result in early design just saying click, 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 floor plan, extrude, I'm done, is not knowing what defaults are being used there and what information is there. So if you don't know what's going on in the defaults, it's black box and 
it's information's only as good as what you're giving it. So um, ASHRAE has a real good source of information here. There's chapter uh, 19 out of the uh, 2013 fundamentals and on energy estimating and modeling methods. Now, a lot of it just is really detailed. It's a long chapter, I think 20 some pages, which is long for an ASHRAE uh, handbook chapter. A lot of detail about all the various methods. But what I like is up in the, the general considerations on the front page, it talks about these issues. What should I be considering when I'm looking for a tool? What are the important parts that I should be working on here? I always like to focus on these three, because I think the others kind of come with it. But is it sensitive? If I change a glass type in a wall, am I going to get a change? Is it sensitive enough? And does it have enough coverage of what I'm doing? Uh, is it going to be able to handle what I'm working on? Um, validation. Uh, is the tool tested using several of the standards? There's a, an ISO standard, which is pretty generalized, not very specific, but there's also ASHRAE standard 140 that most of the tools have been tested with. They're wonderful for showing changes in there. Um, I don't think I have, uh, I'm confused because I just did another presentation. Now, I don't have any slides, but for the Energy Plus results, for example, they'll show the changes in each build for a version to see what's going on. And if they get a change that they didn't expect, they go back and figure out what the bug was introduced, and that's what these have been great for. Reproducibility comes with the sensitivity and the validation. Ease of use is really an interface issue, and I think it's really important if you have something you're comfortable with. Speed and cost. You kind of have to balance uh, speed with uh, um, some of the other things. That sensitivity may cause it to be longer to run. Uh, energy cost takes four plus times longer than a uh, than to run. Uh, cost, everything from free to $10,000 is about what the marketplace is right now. And so, but you kind of get what you pay for with free. You get the, the free stuff. Uh, it's really good to be able to use it to start with, but you're probably going to want to graduate to something that's going to make it easier. So how do I try to, or how do I select the tool? Uh, first, what are you trying to do? What, what is it you're looking for? What's the method? Uh, if you're just doing something simple, say I'm changing out lights. Now, quite frankly, a count of the watts and a change on the schedule is maybe enough for that. It has some interactive effects with heating, but unless there's a lot more daylighting or something else. But if you're just doing something else, uh, maybe a change in the HVAC system, in method every day, maybe enough. Um, so, but it comes down to if you start looking at interactions, you have lights that are on and off that are dependent on daylight coming in through the windows, and that affects the heating and cooling systems. You may want to look at uh, something simulation based result. And that just kind of comes to where you are in that uh, continuum. Uh, you need to make sure the tool can predict the physics you're in. If you're doing radiant systems, uh, Energy Plus does it, other tools do it, Doe2 doesn't. Doe2 has a lumped radiance that's a uh, part that you can't really separate out and it makes it very difficult to do radiant. Does it do daylighting well? Does it do it uh, enough detail for what you're doing for the, for the controls? Probably not. Uh, ground heat transfer is a big issue. Does it do it well? Um, and uh, some of the tools have better methods. Some of them just basically ignore ground heat transfer and hope you get enough insulation in there. Specific HVAC system configuration is probably also a, a real issue. So three good sources for information. ASHRAE is not going to tell you which tool to use because they've got this um, anti uh, uh, I've got a bias against specific product names uh, that stung really badly 50 years ago and they haven't backed off at all. Um, the good thing is um, in two weeks there's an ASHRAE ABIPSA USA conference in Atlanta and part of it is actually sitting there comparing different software tools, naming them. 
if you're interested, can't travel, they can, there's an online version that you'll be able to, uh, to be able to follow at the same time. But the handbook, uh, chapter 19 in the 2013 fundamentals, the software tools directory, it's a good start, but it doesn't really give you a lot of detail in there. There's also this um, book put out a couple years ago, uh, Building Performance Simulation for Design and Operation, intended as kind of an introductory textbook. It's a good way to start. It, it covers everything from urban down to very detailed daylighting. Um, and it's a, it's a great resource uh, for that uh, if you're trying to get started in that. So why use it? I've kind of covered some of this already, but it, it allows you to make decisions from early design all the way into operation M&D, et cetera. It's just a, a very powerful tool for doing what ifs. It also allows you to focus what, where it's important. If you create a model at the beginning and it says that lighting's gonna be important in this, in this building, then that's where you need to focus the energy. Uh, but it's important to have everything uh, together where you're trying to deal with it. Um, and allow you to look at where you are versus 90.1 energy code or benchmark or any kind of goals you may set throughout. And it's really important. Too many times I see it used kind of late design development into construction documents when it's too late to really affect any change in what you're doing. And you won't get a, a great building out of that. Renewable systems, the well, price is coming way down on that. And there are large areas of the U.S. now where the prices are such that renewable is cheaper than, than electricity. Um, so you don't want to oversize them because you don't want to be giving away the power or giving it away at the end of the This would be a way to you know what the price could be. So is evaluating alternatives. The simulation tools, and you'll, I'll talk a little more about it, but predicting actual energy use is a challenge. You have to have really good data to be able to do it. You can do it. But generally, we don't know in design how the building's going to be operated. Any sort of thing, those alternatives, the change in performance is going to be uh, pretty similar regardless of what use is. And that's where it's really powerful. And I always say it's cheaper than building the wrong building. Remember, you're going to be building for many years. Uh, a lot of the office buildings will last 50 to 100 years uh, unless they get really short, um, I mean, unless they get really out of date and you can't um, economically use them anymore. Retail sector um, is. Uh, is often very different. I know that Walmart, Target look at an economic life of seven to ten years for their stores. Now it'll be reused for something else, but they'll gut it or or just abandon it and open it because the line pattern is changed. But that 50 to 100 years you may have uh, bought into energy efficiency. If we look at uh, workflow challenges, and this is a project I worked on 30 years ago. Um, and this is the days when Do2 was on a mainframe computer and it was acoustic couplers and it, it was a, a real challenge to do Do2. But we did a hundred some runs over 18 months for this project from pre-design through construction. Setting a baseline target, uh, schematic design, looking at the code, and then they went, oh, we forgot to tell you guys about the 50 kW data center that's going to be in here, uh, which kind of jumped the numbers up. Um, at the same time, the building went from L-shaped and schematic to H-shaped in um, design development to X with a and we had to create a new building model every time. We also went as far as helping evaluate all alternatives for the owner. Uh, of chillers, they were looking at different efficiency of chillers. We got actual curves for the specific chillers that were in there. Uh, to be able to do that. But our traditional workflow with this early design through construction documents, the building changed radically. The level of detail changes throughout, and you're seeing that reflected now in BIM with its level of detail or LOD. 
uh, increasing detail, multiple solutions throughout the line. If you have an existing you may be lucky to, uh, to have drawings. Uh, there are some solutions today that I think are, um, are helping with that. There's point cloud, you may have heard, where you can go in and, and have a laser and shoot everything and it'll create a, a 3D BIM model and I've seen a detailed 3D BIM model of that. I've seen it used, it was one done for the White House, I didn't really have good drawings of the interior. This got all the detail of the molding uh, along the ceiling. So these are, are great for doing that. You can do ones that are not quite so detailed. Another cool thing recently, um, with Google Earth being able to go to the site, you have the rooftop. And you probably can get enough other data from looking at it, uh, either at Street View or even just going and measuring a few things, that you can create a model to get you started. That's not going to give you the interior details or how the wall's constructed, but at least give you a good starting. A challenge, though. But our traditional practice has been manual input. We're having to translate stuff from the drawings. You're going to make mistakes. There are going to be things you leave out, things that you forget to do. We've had the virtual data for a while, the 2D CAD BIM now, but it gives you maybe overly robust geometry. And I'll use an example. You know, this room is not that bad, but many of the rooms I've been in, uh, they have columns and the little cutouts for the columns and all the little detail. The BIM model will bring that across. The columns will become separate spaces or separate structural when you translate it and it, it, uh, it's more detail because thermally it doesn't really matter. Uh, so maybe sometimes we kind of overdo it with that. The other problem is the BIM models, although they have places for uh, having data about what the objects are and what the, maybe the thermal physical characteristics, they're empty. I mean, quite frankly, a BIM model is not used for energy in most cases. The architect, the engineer are using it to produce construction documents. That's what you're trying to do. So having that other data is probably not a, a part of their workforce or reasonable. So manual model, paper, or BIM, back to pencil and calculators, trying to get it into whatever format the software needs, and this is an old program from five or six years ago, uh, out to analysis results. Does it even make sense? Does it fit with what I understand? And probably made a mistake somewhere, and that's where you've got to go back and a lot of iteration here. This is my favorite, and partly because I think we get too much data sometimes in the 3D models. I like the, uh, sorry, in the, I like to start with a 2D model because then I can do my grouping of zoning. I can simplify the model geometrically when I'm doing it. And a lot of the tools today will make that pretty easy to take the 2D, give it a, a, a height for the space and the plenum, and then you create that model and then I have an energy model. That can take a little bit of work, but I find it's, I know what's in the model at that point. I'm not too worried about it. It's based on the space. One of the things that we're seeing, though, is these true 3D BIM models getting transferred to energy models. And the, the term I see used is more of an analytical model. Simplifying things, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. But uh, GBXML, IFCs, even direct within the software code itself right now, uh, it, within the BIM model to get you an energy model. A lot more robust, but a lot more surfaces. You see that all these individual surfaces are, uh, have to be dealt with there. So, analytical model is to try to convert what has more. Closed gaps, BIM models don't have floors. I've seen this time and time again. You've got to create a story. Uh, you know, the physical number of stories in there uh, and closed in cell geometry. You see the blue part there, that uh, wasn't enclosed correctly in the model and it had to be inferred from what was going on here. The other thing, they don't really care where they are. Space adjacency doesn't matter, but it matters in your simulation model. So you need to know this wall 
is on this side of that space and this side of that space so that they can look at heat flows so that you can work with that. So there's some uh, good efforts here. Building Smart, uh, which I mentioned with the industry foundation classes, very robust, detailed. Pretty much all of the uh, BIM models use it. The problem is they don't always implement everything. There is a robust MEP portion of the IFCs has been there for a decade. I've yet to see anybody use it. Um, it's just not, you don't get that information translated. So you wind up mostly with geometry coming across, which is great, but it's not enough. Uh, it doesn't simplify anything, so every little detail gets in there, and sometimes that's, you just get too much. Uh, GBXML um, was a came out of California Research uh, Green Building Studio was a company, and Autodesk bought them. They spun GBXML off into a nonprofit, and all the BIM manufacturers do it. Specifically, uh, focused on um, getting BIM over to energy simulation, and that's really the focus for it. it it's not trying to do what IFC is trying to do with all the time. Autodesk, once they, they bought uh, Green Building Studio, um, they look at a web conversion of all the major BIM formats, you basically submit it and get it back. It has some limited coverage. I know that they're doing uh, e coverage. What I found, I tried to use it. My kid's school was doing, was looking to replace a 60-year-old uh, Cata 3 wing, and uh, they had a model. The architect had a great model, it, schematic. I put it through Green Building Studio, and when I got back from Green Building Studio, it wasn't drawn correctly. The layers weren't in the order that Green Building Studio assumed they needed to be, and for that reason, I didn't use the model. In that case, I took the 2D BIM, extruded it, and within about 40 minutes had a model, but it was, it was quicker. Um, the architect, when I said, oh, your model's not drawn correctly, looked at me and said, no way am I redrawing anything. Probably for the next uh, foreseeable future is this direct from BIM to SIM. And you know, Autodesk, Bentley, Graphisoft already have some starts of that, of direct from BIM to an energy model. For Autodesk and Graphisoft, it's uh, kind of early design. They have tools uh, that will do work in that uh, BIM uh, environment right now. Uh, Bentley, a little different approach. Uh, but I really think this is kind of key to making it easy. If we can simplify your work through interoperability to get a model quickly within a few minutes, then that's going to make a lot uh, simulation more mainstream, make you more effective and efficient. So there is one now. This is actually a Bentley product, and I'll, I'll show it in just a second. Um, I'm going to demo a couple things here, uh, a 2D, uh, 3D, and 2D. This is a paper I found on the web, uh, some a master's class at Stanford had done some things on automating but it had a house plan, that was what I was looking for. Um, I was able to create a model pretty quickly from that. Yeah, the, the biggest challenge here with a PDF is, and BIM models do. So, but able to bring that in, uh, I know that this dimension is 12 feet. You can't quite see it, but it does say it on there. And then from that, I was able to trace the building and create a model within hmm, 15 minutes or so. Um, here's a model that came in through uh, GBXML, and I've kind of fudged it a little bit here. I've, I've already cleaned it up. This is a, a model that uh, was uh, created of a school, 1960s era, built in Australia. And uh, one of the things you could see seems to be a gap here. Well, GBXML has uh, some features. It forces, if you're within the footprint of the building, every space has to be accounted for. In this case, that gap is the structure. It created rooms between the two floors of that foot-deep structure. 
and uh, it, that didn't make any sense. Also, there were some vestibules and some little spaces under the stairs, and everything got put into uh, a space. But what was really nice about this, and a little tough to see, but it had interior windows and transoms along with operable exterior windows. And what they were doing was trying to create a model which would allow them to uh, look at natural ventilation and natural ventilation flow. So they had all the bits and components there, and it was actually not that hard to create a, a natural ventilation model from this using Energy Plus. Uh, the other one, you got a sketch. You can you can bring it in. So something I did just on my napkin, and that's ten minutes later. I've got a ten-story, seven-story building. It's uh, pretty pretty straightforward to do. So I'm going to show you a little bit uh, about this. Let me see if I can. So this is our tool. Um, it has tabs, kind of like Office, Microsoft Office got a few years ago. Home tab to deal with geometry. Data manager for our data sets. System manager for HVAC calculation. Uh, I'm going to bring in, this is a model that uh, was brought in uh, from directly from a BIM model. And this is probably the second best one I've ever seen. I've seen one other from a, uh, an LA consultant that really had a, a good one. It's loading right now, so it's taking a little time. It gives you the images up front. Uh, it's the views you can control, all the, all the information there. This is all uh, based on floors uh, and then rooms with uh, different subdivisions. Um, each of the rooms, let's see if I can find an office, open plan. It has surfaces associated with it. You see all the partition detail. That's a lot of partitions. Even the exposed walls with their windows. And if I knew which one I just clicked on, you could see it highlighted on the model. I, I don't know. Uh, the components part of this is where we have lighting, uh, occupancy, internal gains, ventilation, infiltration, daylighting controls that you can add. Uh, because it's Energy Plus, you can do multiple lighting, occupancy gains, et cetera, within their different ways. So per square foot, a single wattage, however you want to control it with different schedules. Um, as far as the data managers, we have a weather manager, materials manager. Um, I'm not going to, because it looks just schedules. Schedules are based on uh, 90.1 right now. We have. Uh, calculations that will do the 90.1 calculations, but standard ASHRAE uh, 2004, 7, and 10 are in here. 2013 is underway. Uh, nobody's adopted it yet, but if I take 2010, I'll get a different list of building types and uh, space types, offices, if I look at office, it'll give me defaults. I can also set my own constructions or I can use defaults, which you can set at the beginning. For there, it has occupancy uh, with a schedule from ASHRAE and the, the defaults for that. It will have the lighting. Uh, here's, you know, you know, what I'm trying to show you is that you can change units on the fly. But uh, So 1.1 watts a square foot is, uh, is the, uh, what the wattage is. It's got the lighting related to that and ventilation, infiltration, gains, et cetera, so that you have all the bits and pieces. This includes data for 90.1 and 62, so you've got the ventilation data there as well. The good thing is you can, as you're creating spaces, you can assign the room types to the space, and that way you get all this rich detail without having to, to go through and put it in. You can then customize it for each space. Uh, system managers, uh, HVAC manager, well, I'll show that in just a sec. Uh, zone manager, I think this product is kind of unique in that you can have multiple ways of zoning a building. And you kind of you see it here. We've got all rooms. That has every room in the building, 222. I've got first floor rooms. I've got second floor. 
third, so on, all the way up to the top. I can also group them by space type. I want all the offices together so I can make one change that will affect them. Uh, toilet, circulation, reception, uh, other things just like that. Uh, at simulation time, you select which of the zoning methods you want. So you could have a zoning method that you use for doing your uh, sizing calculation separate from how you do your energy calculation. The HVAC manager is an attempt to try to take um, the complexity that is energy plus and make it useful. Um, on the application side, that's our library. And what we have here is a set of different system types. So here's a dedicated outside air system. Let's go with that one. Now, that's a complete HVAC system for Energy Plus. And you'll s I have a toolbox here. These are all the Energy Plus components. And say, for example, I want to bring a different fan in, an on-off fan. Well, this is on the application side. I need to count. Let's, uh, let's copy the project. It won't let me edit it here. So if I can just, I want to drag a fan over here. Actually, it's the wrong system because the fans are built in. But then I could reconnect it, change it, however I want to deal with it. Um, these are all interactive. I mean, they look all nice and square, but they've just been lined up. So here we have a condenser loop, a chill water loop, a hot water loop, and then the air loop with uh, the package unit uh, connected. The room is. Uh, not that much. Uh, the rooms have components. Here's the inlet and the outlet on the on the room. It's got the fan coil here, so you can have multiple systems. You can create your own rooms here. This one has thermostat. But let me show you the data side. This is um, I'm going to convert. Now let's go back to the application side so you can see. Uh, These are all the Energy Plus objects that I get when I've used that. So by taking this kind of pre-configured system, I can start with it and, and work with it pretty easily. Uh, there are new ones here. There's a, um, a PV system, and it's pretty simple, um, just a 20 and a 9. Um, it's also a new refrigeration system on here. Uh, for grocery stores, freezers, and you can just basically mix and match and change it to match whatever you're trying to do. There's one with open cases. And what we have created is about 30 different uh, pre-configured systems at this point. We have all the ASHRAE uh, baseline systems. There's fan coil, electric heat, four pipe fan coil, packaged, which right now is only data. We, the diagram is pretty simple. There's a, a PTAC uh, with hot water. Uh, it's PTAC with electric. I mean, it's through the wall unit is pretty much all it is. Um, just various system types that you can see. So you can start with any of these um, and then modify them to, to make it easier. For example, let me just copy that over to my project. And say, for example, I want to, this has got a, um, a reheat box. No, this, is, this has got a, a different system. But I could put a, a go over here to my toolbox and say I want a um, different room. So I'll type in room and then look at the room components and see that maybe I want uh, just a supply air diffuser. And I can assign different rooms to each of these components. And it's pretty simple just to put a break line there. And you can clean it up and move around. Then it's a matter of just saying which rooms uh, use the different system types. And it, it'll work pretty cleanly. I mean, the only concern it says right now is I haven't assigned any rooms to it. So, 
Um, so I do want to show you quickly well the calculation side. I'm not going to do the calculation. The it's got steady state, so if you want to do ASHRAE heat loss calculations here, you can. ASHRAE heat gain, the RTS are available. It also do prescriptive, so that um, if, for example, I want to do 62.1 or 90.1 2004, I just select it, and it'll create the um, uh, the PDF showing the results and whether you comply or not, and uh, actually pull that in for you. So this ca case I fail. I've got a pretty bad envelope here, but the rest of it. Um, and then I can go look at here's the building envelope. Uh, it's okay. Yes, I know. And it's completed giving me the different uh, uh, floor or the different surface types, the area, and the U value associated with them. So it makes it easier for you to do. Um, the simulation part is is energy plus. I'm not going to go into detail here, but you could do multiple runs. You can do a single floor, single room. This, you can also uh, automatically create the baseline and budget buildings just by ticking these boxes. I'm not going to run them here because this building's ridiculously big. Uh, I can also select any of the Energy Plus uh, out, standard output reports, and I can control which other data get uh, information here. So let me go back. I'm going to create a new um, project and. One of the things I'm going to use our conceptual modeler just to show you what that is. Now, take a second to clear. Um, you may not be able to see, but there's a, now a grid on here, and I've selected IP units, so the grid is four feet. There are dots between it. Uh, the conceptual is pretty simple. Three steps, tell me about the building, tell me about your floors and zoning, and select an HVAC. And that's enough to get a simulation. So building type, uh, say I'm going to take an office, I'll give it an overall building height, we'll say 60 feet, uh, predominant room type. And what it's giving me now are office spaces. So I'm going to say this is uh, open plan, we'll select 2010. Now what I get here are the defaults for that occupancy density, 200 square feet a person, 0.98 watts per square foot, and half a watt of internal gain. And then I can pick, um, I don't think I have Boise in my list, uh, let's go San Francisco. You can import uh, the data for any weather file for Energy Plus. Once I click apply, now it thinks I want to do a 60 zone build or 60 square foot building. I'm going to back out because this is kind of small. Okay, apply. And it just wants me to So you saw it flashed create try to create the uh, uh, spaces. I'm going to try to move this out of the way. And what it's created was a volume that's now 60 feet high for that. I have choices on zoning. Uh, I'm going to say five floors. We'll pick 76%. I'm not going to put overhangs on here. It's given me a 15-foot zone. I can change that to 25 or whatever I think my exterior is going to be. And then click Next. And what it'll do now, it's creating the spaces one by one. and uh, creating the conceptual model for all the floors. Uh, I can change my display. Let's see. So now I can do that. These are all rotatable, so I can look around at the spaces. Even though I've got basically the same um, floor uh, plan on everything, I can go back in and change one floor plan and, and do the zoning. I won't just because of time. The last step in getting a conceptual model is to pick an HVAC. Any of the ones that have already been pre-created, I can. Uh, so maybe I'll do a VAV with water cold chiller for this. And when it's done, when it comes back, 
by now it's inserting the VAV boxes in every zone. I now have a full model. It's able to simulate, able to run. Um, I can change a lot of this input uh, on the fly, go back and reset some of these and do new simulations if I want. But that's, um, that, that's basically there. So that's a quick introduction to that. I want to finish up. Um, so just a couple more slides, I promise. I'll talk briefly about simulation versus operating energy. And I just want to reemphasize that because there's been a lot of criticism of, for, of simulation that it doesn't match energy use. Well, it can't. And the, the, just, you don't know enough information about it. But I really think and have found that simulation has been critical in supporting decision making. So this is a building that has the uh, uh, treats its own wastewater. That curved roof is covered with PV. They covered a parking lot next door to get enough to make it zero energy. Uh, but they, they needed that information to be able to deal with it. But real buildings are used more energy, PV produces less power, controls are ideal in simulation. There's no such thing in the real world. Uh, and occupants don't complain very loudly in your model. You know, percent, percent hours out of, out of range doesn't really cover it. Uh, but it does come down to the more I know about the building and how it's going to operate, how it's constructed, I can match the utility bill. You can do that, but it takes a lot more. Therefore, a design model where you don't know in a spec building that whether it's going to have a call center or whether it's going to be lawyers' offices, very different models. But you have to make some assumptions. And that's, that's a reasonable thing to do at that time. The good news is, though, that the energy savings you predict are probably still accurate. That range is accurate. Even if your overall energy is a lot higher, you still will have saved a substantial amount of energy for, for the user. Garbage in, garbage out. Um, last uh, couple slides here. Uh, Stuart Brand did a great book on uh, uh, how on how buildings learn, and the cover of it has two buildings. One built. Uh, in late 1850s, or a pair of buildings built in late 1850s, New Orleans. And then he had a picture of how they look today. Um, hardly tell that, they're, that those are the same buildings. But what you see, another floor got added on the one on the left, uh, a kind of a different facade type for the one on the right, railings, all sorts of changes go on. And his main point is that when we design buildings, we're forecasting how they're going to be used. And that changes from day one. Uh, so we can't forecast that well enough to know what's going to happen. Users change their building from the time they start moving in. And that, that's what we need to take away from our models, that we can't really uh, do that. So the right, the right slide. Uh, I, I really think that building simulation is one of the more powerful tools we have to be able to, to influence and, and change how our buildings uh, are there. They're great for evaluating computing technologies and systems. It is only as good as the data you give it. So if you're kind of sloppy about your inputs, you, your results are going to be sloppy. You're not going to be able to trust them as much. Um, Getting from BIM to SIM is still pretty much a challenge. I, I personally still like using 2D models because there's so much translation that's happening that I don't know what's going on. And as I said, I've seen only two good uh, interoperability models. And one of them, I think, was a, um, it had no space typing, the big one I was just showing you there earlier. Uh, the other one had gone into detail, but they'd had, they stayed inside the BIM model to make all the space typing and make it work. Uh, sometimes you don't have time to do that. Uh, if this is going to work, we've got to have attributes. We've got to have walls that are truly walls that have some sort of description that at least I can translate into uh, thermal physical properties. Um, and that's just not there today. Equipment and systems are even. I still think that interoperability is our hope for getting this uh, to where it's usable, but we're really not um, 
getting a push on the software manufacturers to do that as much as we should. I think they kind of got the geometry and stopped. So last slide, I promise, Katie. Um, one of the things that I see in, in my work at DOE, uh, one of the things that seems very clear, we sometimes forget to look at various performance aspects, and if we don't, we mess them up. The building I showed you, that college building outside Cleveland, the electric boiler set the peak demand for that building in February, and they had to pay for that until they got it fixed. They looked at energy and peak demand, and energy, and energy costs really didn't come into the equation. If they looked at energy costs, they would have made sure that that electric boiler stayed off because the heat pumps were much more efficient. But those are not the only metrics we really should look at. Uh, water is becoming more expensive. Um, it, it is a load on the municipals. I'm surprised we don't get charged more. Uh, indoor environmental quality, all the aspects of it from thermal comfort, visual comfort, uh, acoustics, all the areas that we uh, in air quality, of course. Uh, really need to be looked at. Otherwise, we'll probably fail in, in one of those in some way. Carbon, are we setting targets for doing that? Energy and carbon are kind of interchangeable, not entirely because of fuel sources, but there's some opportunities there to, to look at it, and we can kind of push the overall environment uh, footprint down. So one of the things I found in working uh, with a number of uh, large corporations while I was at DOE, is as engineers, architects, we think of our numbers and our normal rationalization of per square foot. And businesses don't. Um, if you're a hotel, occupied room, sales per occupied room is their metric. And so what you need to do is kind of train, change your mindset. That dollar per square foot or whatever your savings are needs to be translated into, I can save you $100 per occupied room per year. That gets their attention. That really does. So sales, okay, they're, they're still in per square foot. But in terms of what um, other models, go find out what the business you're working for is looking at, what, what their economic model is that they're looking at, what, you know, what do they define their success for ROI. Schools, probably your student. If you tell the school board that I can save you uh, $250 a student a year, that's a lot more meaningful to them because they are thinking in terms of per student as well. So, Try to think more holistically on, on the things that you're dealing with and make sure that you're speaking to clients' uh, economics. So with that, I'll leave for questions. And I'm sorry, I'm, I know I'm really long. So thank you. And then any online questions we don't get to, um, we will make sure to forward to him. So, are there any questions? So, taking advantage of your history with the industry, especially uh, with this BIM to SIM topic of today, you know, it's always been a year out. It's always been two years out. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about where we thought we would be and maybe a little bit where you really honestly think we'll be in five years or something along those lines. Um, I think when the what's now Building Smart got set up with the IFCs and started moving that, they thought within 10 years that they would transform the market. The reality is that here we are almost 20 years later since that started and there's just not a push for it in the market. There are some efficiencies. There's some very interesting um, efforts, mostly at building owner levels, to try to get that interoperability because they're using the data about the building in lots of ways that maybe uh, we wouldn't just traditionally design and construction. And so I think IFCs has some legs, but it's going to just take a change. There's not demand. Um, Five years, well, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to make huge amounts of progress in some areas. I, 
I do believe that this interest at the software developer level, the major that are looking at simulation is kind of an integral part of what they do, try to get you lead points within your BIM model, uh, is going to help, but it's a big challenge. Uh, it's because there's a lot of data and the traditional user or creator of the BIM model is not somebody who needs it for lead point. And that, that's kind of, I think, what needs to change is we have to use the same BIM model and be able to contribute to both of them until we see that change. Before more specifically on, on software, I understand Energy Plus is headed to C++ and that was somewhat driven by Autodesk. I was curious if that's going to have any effect on this interoperability and I, no, and quite frankly, I don't quite understand Autodesk's reason for doing that. Um, they and the Fortran to C++ right now. The last I heard, the C++ takes four to five times as long to run, so it's kind of going the wrong way. That was uh, one of the things we kind of forget. Fortran is massively better than C++ for doing calculations. And 90% of what Energy Plus does is calculation. The part that Fortran's really bad at is creating reports, pulling data out of data sets. That's where C++. And my, my opinion would be that we should have created a mixed model that the basic calculations stayed in Fortran, were sped up. They, I mean, you can always optimize stuff. But then deal with the I.O. and may, uh, make that much faster. I did some runs for my Ph.D. a while ago and doing the calculations for this building took 17 minutes and then to get the data out and I had data at the time stamp level so I had 15 minute data for everything uh, took 25. Just creating the reports took that. If it had been C it would have been like that. It would, it's just a Fortran's really bad at string manipulation and that, that's what that is. Um, I don't, I mean, Energy Plus is open source, so it's not going to really affect that uh, ability to do the interoperability there. Uh, there is some effort being looked at to try to do an XML version of the input, but that takes us away from being able to use editors. Um, because with XML you have to have the strings around it, it has to be formatted right, and an editor that will handle that is a very different editor than the text editors that are available today. Um, I hope to see it soon. I'd like to, to play with it. I haven't seen a running version yet. Yeah. Anyone else? Do you want to do, are there any online? Or, oh, here we go. I guess I'm kind of curious. You kind of stated that earlier that it's, it's kind of more beneficial to start your energy models early on in the design. <coughs> And so I'm curious, it seems like a lot of designers use, they don't start in BIM necessarily. They start in like SketchUp or uh -huh. you know, like hand sketches like you showed. Right. Um, so can you take like a SketchUp model and export that to your uh, Energy Plus? Yes. I mean, um, Open Studio has a, a graphics plugin for SketchUp. Um, and a lot of other things, and it's a free free product. Um, and what it'll allow you to do is to create your model in SketchUp. It won't take an existing one and allow you to create a model. You can, I have seen small, uh, SketchUp's got one issue, is the larger the building gets, the slower and the slower and the slower SketchUp. I mean, it, it seems exponential. So a nice small building is fine. You go to a 10-story building with lots of spaces, and it's just going to take a long time. But what I've seen able to do is that you can cut a zone out of SketchUp, create an Energy Plus zone, and paste that into the Energy Plus zone, and it'll work. But that can take a long time if you've got a big building. Um, it's almost easier to start from the floor plan and do an extrusion at that, that period. So but, would it be more beneficial than design your building in? Energy Plus? Well, but Energy Plus is really not. It, 
it doesn't have all the details. Walls are two-dimensional. Uh, they have depth for thermal physical properties, but it really is just a plane. And a BIM model, you need the full, uh, you need, you know, if you're doing construction, you need to have the full detail. I think it is better to try to do that energy plus model. The one thing that happens is the geometry gets changed radically, and sometimes you have to make a decision. I've got all my space typing done. I know what that's going to be, and I know kind of the systems. I know enough of that. Throw the geometry way, start again, and then reassign the stuff. It sometimes can take less time doing um, something like that in, in uh, SketchUp than it would, uh, or some of the other models, than it would to try to you know rejigger everything. All right, well, if there's nothing else, um, thank you very much. And for everyone online and here, if you could fill out an evaluation before you go, I would really appreciate it. I apologize for not passing them out sooner, but I will do that now. And um, yeah, let's thank Drew Crawley. <laughs>